not long before he died in that plane wreck, John Jr. called me one day just out of the blue. <laughs> he said, Fred, how the hell are you? <laughs> hey, you got to like the guy. Just a friendly guy. He said, I'm going to make you one of my most fascinating men. Number one is uh, that goofy governor of uh, Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, Dennis Hastert, speaker. Number two, George, George W. Bush, number three, and Anthony Williams, who's the mayor of Washington, is four. So there I come, number five. Look at old Geraldo, number 16. See, he ain't nothing. 16. And old Larry Flint's number 20. That ought to give him pause for dating with me. Anyway, that's good. I hated to see the guy get killed. I kind of, I really like him. message that you're about to hear it may offend some and this station neither this station or any of our sponsors support it you know howard stern now that's a little bit of an insult isn't it to me for a guy like howard stern old potty mouth himself says now this may be offensive that stuff you've been doing ain't offensive, but why? Me talking five months is offensive. Right here, get right here. You're pathetic. You people are pathetic. You're a disgrace to your own God, your own Bible. Some big Miami station had me debating Larry Flint. Flint. Larry Flint. I said, I'm sorry that Paul Wells sued you in that silly case because I think you've got the right to say that if you want to say it. I said, and I'll tell you another thing, Brother Larry. Your chances of getting to heaven are better than your Paul Wells. I feel, sorry. I feel sorry for you, B. If you try to make anything out of this film. When I was uh, 14, I started going to a Baptist church. And that's when my life changed. And his changed about when he was 16. I was just a happy little kid, Eagle Scout. Graduated from high school when I was 16, top of the class, 250-something, I think. Had an appointment to West Point, you know, military academy. His dad, you know, helped get him this appointment to West Point because he had some political clout, I guess. And then he got saved in an evangelistic meeting. I had a genuine religious heart experience, a genuine deep-down dose. So he turned down the appointment to West Point and started preaching, going to Bible school. And his, well, needless to say, his, his dad wasn't happy with him. My dad said, Bubba, you are not making people mad enough quick enough. He was mad at me. He said, I recommend you start just kicking them in the shin. As soon as you meet somebody, just kick them in the shin. Then you won't have to mess around waiting to make them mad because you're certainly making them mad. <laughs> He was the southern gentleman, his accent, and uh, I liked the way he preached. When the Lord Jesus Christ in his own words describes in some little detail that great drama that's the most important event in all of human history, time, and eternity, this event, the great general judgment. Lord Jesus Christ, then shall he say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For uh, when you had opportunity at one of Billy Graham's campaigns, you went forward, took good old Jesus as your very own personal Savior. No! Get real! 
I was going to a church in Glendale, which is a suburb of Phoenix then. It isn't now, but he uh, came there to preach. I remember I went down, kneeled down on my knees and took Jesus as my Savior. Yeah, you wanted a super bellboy to help you carry your baggage through life. That's all you wanted, you hypocrite, you. I was working for the lady whose husband brought him there. Uh, he was traveling, he brought him in to speak at the church. And uh, that's where I met him in their home. They had him there to eat. You simply cannot open the Bible anywhere, anywhere, I dare you! And you're very shortly going to come upon this subject of the wrath of God and it's, sudden, it's sooner or later going to creep into the edges of your understanding that the love of God and the mercy of God is reserved for the penitent. Mrs. Woods was an Italian lady, so she was matchmaking. <laughs> you want to go to hell? Fine. Fine. I love it. I love the thoughts of you going to hell. I got some Bible here. I'll be paying close attention to you, brother, sister, in hell. As the eternal ages roll by, I'll be watching you suffer and all the nuances of your exquisite torment and pain and how you do. Eternity, you know, is a long time. I'll be watching you. I'll be watching you, paying close attention. But then she found out he was a little younger, so she said, oh, you don't want him. <laughs> but he had other ideas, I guess. Dry, deadhead preachers talk about God, you love you, you're gonna be such a wonderful blood, 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 blood. Ain't nobody listening to you but hell-bound sinners and reprobates. We were engaged quite early. We hadn't known each other very long. You crazy fool Greeks in your stupid, gross darkness and all your philosophies and great teachers are like blind men groping, groping, groping. I was 27 when the oldest was born and I was 42 when the 13th when I was born. Uh, Tread Jr., Mark, Catherine, Margie, Shirley, Nathan, Jonathan, Rebecca, Elizabeth, Timothy, Dortha, Rachel, and Abigail. Name most of them. You know, he'd always pick out the name. And he liked the children. He wanted the children. 